Well, welcome everyone. We're so glad that you're here tonight. My name is Karen. I work at the Linwood Library. And um, tonight we're delighted to have a virtual art walk, including the work of Linwood third graders. We're so proud of them. Um, they are just so creative and so talented. And we are so glad that they love reading and books. And tonight our special guest is Ellie Peterson. She's a Seattle area author and artist. Welcome. I'll introduce Ellie in just a few moments, but first we have a couple of important announcements. We are so grateful to our friends of the Linwood Library for their generous support of this program. They have played an important role in encouraging young artists in Linwood for almost 30 years, and we really appreciate it. Let's give them some silent applause. <laughs> Yay, a round of applause too. We also appreciate our library media specialists, our teachers and our parents in the Edmonds School District and all the support and nurturing that they provide. Let's give them some applause too. Yay. And now a housekeeping item or two to make it easier for everyone to hear and to eliminate the background noise, your mics will all be muted. But if you like, you can put questions for the author in the chat and um, Natalie and I will um, ask them as time permits at the end of Ellie's presentation. And so I should introduce Natalie. We have additional Snow Isle Library staff with us today to help run the program. My co-host is Natalie. Say hello to her. And she and I will be monitoring the chat. The chat function is typically at the bottom of your screen. If you click on it, you can send a message to the panelists or you can also send a message to all the attendees and the panelists. Um, you can um, send a chat if you have any concerns or if you need help with any of the Zoom functions today. This event is being recorded for later viewing on the Snow Isle Library's YouTube channel. Just to let you know, if you send a message in the chat tonight, um, your chat will be included in that recording. All right, let's get started. We are so pleased to have STEM author Ellie Peterson with us tonight. Ellie has written The Reason for the Seasons, It's a Round, Round World, and she's written some other books too. We, she's going to share more about her artistic inspiration and how she creates her books. And I can hardly wait to hear what she has to say. So please welcome Ellie Peterson. Hey, thank you. Thanks, you guys. And I have to tell all you kids out there who made your posters. I looked at all of your posters when they were posted on Facebook. They were amazing. So I tried to comment on every single one of them. I hope that I did. Um, I thought that they were so creative. I, I read a lot of the books that you guys had made posters for and I was really just surprised and impressed with some of the scenes that you depicted inside, different takes that you took on the um, kind of the themes and topics of the book. So nice job, everybody. Um, I'm really glad to be here. Thank you very much, Snow Owl Libraries, for having me here. Uh, I have um, always, always had a, you know, deep and abiding love for libraries when I was a kid. Um, my mom was working on her GED and she would take us to the library and she'd work on her GED and we'd go off to the kids section of the library and just curl up with a stack of books on the, the window seat there and it still holds a very special place in my heart. So I think the work you guys are doing is phenomenal. Um, so I wanted to share with you guys um, a little presentation here. And what I'd like to talk to you guys about today is how art and science meet. Um, once again, these are my books. So The Reason for the Seasons and It's a Round Round World are two books that I have both um, authored and illustrated. And you guys might know what that means. So uh, being the author means that I write the words and being the illustrator means that I make the pictures. And then over here, Bees Bees, there we go. Now we have presentation mode. This is a book that I illustrated that's authored by um, a local author, Catherine Pryor, who, um, has done the book Sylvia Spinach and Zorro Zucchini, which perhaps you have heard of. Uh, so being an author and an illustrator, 
um, and a science educator might not seem like they have a lot in common. They're kind of two really different professions from a lot of people's perspectives, right? Somebody who's making pictures for books, but is also going around in her lab coat and teaching people science. Hmm, doesn't seem like it would have a lot to do with each other. Um, these are some of the kids that I teach on a daily basis. This is kind of back when we're in regular school and not <laughs> wearing masks and we can be at lab stations close to each other. It almost looks a little weird right now <laughs> with what we're accustomed to. But I teach older kids and these are sixth graders and a lot of the topics that I have taught them, things about um, astronomy, the scientific method, things to do with engineering um, are the topics of the books that I like to um, illustrate and write. So how did I get into both science and art? It started when I was a kid, you know, a couple of things about me besides my, you know, time spent in a library when I was a kid. Um, I was a, I, I was always exploring. I was always out and about and looking for just things to, you know, things to discover. I was always turning over rocks and looking at um, potato bugs and digging up worms. Um, my dad was an avid fisherman and I would go out with him and he'd bring fish home and he'd fillet the fish, but I would dissect the fish, of course. <laughs> and I loved to draw every single day I drew. And I drew a lot of things that, um, you know, maybe you guys like to draw characters. I like to draw clothes. I like to draw houses and buildings, but I did a lot of tracing my favorite characters. I traced a lot of Snoopy and Garfield. Those were favorite characters of mine. And um, I have to say, you know, if anybody ever tells you, oh, well, you're tracing that, that's not really making art. That's absolutely not true. Uh, tracing is a wonderful way to learn how to draw. So don't ever feel like you're not allowed to trace something. Now it's great to branch out and make your own characters too, but I think that tracing is a perfectly acceptable thing to do. All right, moving on. So you might be curious about some of the stuff that I use to, to make art. And so here's some of the stuff that I use. Um, I do some traditional art where I use colored pencils and watercolor paints, as you can see in some of these images. Um, and I, as you can see here, I have a big light pad that I use for tracing, just like I talked about. So sometimes if I draw something just right and I don't want to have to change it anymore, I'll just trace it. it. Makes it a lot easier. I don't have to keep doing it over and over again. Um, but more and more, a lot of my work is becoming digital. So I have an iPad that has a program called Procreate that I love to do illustration on. And my next book that comes out, How to Hug a Pufferfish, which will come out next winter um, of 2022, was all done uh, digitally. So that's been really fun for me to learn and explore with. Maybe you guys do some digital art too on your own with different programs like paint or things like that. Um, so you've seen some things about my art side of my life and my science side of my life and how I came to fall in love with both. But what do they have in common? Well, what they have in common are powers of observation. Now, I want you to think about what does it mean to observe? What are observations? And if you want to put in the chat what you think an observation is, I'd love to see what you think. What does it mean to observe something? What are observations? So you can start putting your ideas in the chat about what that means. Something that is important for both science and art. Okay, observation. Let's see if there's any ideas in there. Anything yet? I don't have anything yet. Anybody have any ideas? What does it mean to observe something? Somebody gave me something like look at it, to look at something. Good, yeah, I think that observation means to study something, somebody says. These are really great reasons. See, I knew if I waited long enough, somebody would give me a little something. So those are great, yeah. Here's um, something else I wanna know from you though. What's the difference between just looking at something and observing something? Hmm. You know, I might just look at something, but if I'm observing it, what makes that different? I want you to reflect on that for a second. 
just looking at something and then observing something. And Yadidia says, um, you know, to study something, which I think goes a little further, but what's involved if you're trying to study something? You guys have any ideas? I wonder if you could put them in the chat. What might we use to make observations? Look at it closely, Ananya. Uh, Anaya says that I think that's the name there. Look at it closely. Yeah, so you're going to look really closely and maybe you're going to start noticing some of the details there. Is it only using your eyes? Do you have to just look to observe something or are there other things you can use to make observations? Cyrus says, well, if you keep on looking on that, you will see the answer. <laughs> Perhaps. You have other senses, right? So yeah, you could look at it closely with tools. Oh, I'm so glad, Cindy, that you brought up the tools because we're going to be talking about tools that can help you make observations. Write it down. Make some notes. That's great. Yes. Observe, learn, make notes. That is really helpful. And keep in mind, you have other senses too, right? So not just seeing things, but you might smell something. You might hear something. It might have a texture that you feel as well. Okay, sometimes observations include taste, but really let's leave the taste just for things that are food, right? <laughs> we don't need to observe everything by, by tasting. Like, hmm, I wonder that tree bark, I'm very, very interested in observing it. Don't go and look at it, it's probably not a good idea. <laughs> so powers of observation, we hear both for art and for science. It's the ability to notice and pay close attention to things. So we might say something like, oh, the author's excellent powers of observation are evident in the book's detailed descriptions. Or we might say the scientist's powers of observations were useful for keeping meticulous field notes. Oh, somebody mentioned notes, right? Taking notes on something. Yes. So, hmm, how do we do it? How do we make good observations? How do we use those powers of observation? Well, here are some things that I encourage you to ask yourself whenever you're making observations, whenever you're trying to study something closely and learn more about it so that you can draw it better or just know more about it. Ask yourself, what do I notice? What would, I hap what would happen if I got really big and kind of just imagine this from the, a huge perspective, or if I got really tiny and was the size of an ant, what would that look like if I was like the size of an ant from my perspective? How would you describe what you are seeing or hearing, right? We talked about other kinds of senses involved. And what new information can I uncover? And that's where the other tools might come in handy to help you uncover some other information. So, whoa, did I scare you with that? Hold on, I better stop. Woo, let's take a pause there. <laughs> Sometimes bees and wasps show up on a screen and everybody goes, whoa, what the heck? Hey, Ellie, don't do that. So here's what I want us to do next. I'm going to actually um, use bees as an example of something that we can observe from a scientific perspective, but also an artistic perspective. And the reason I bring this up is because just a second. That's what I had to do in um, Bees Bees. So I had the story that the author gave me, uh, which is about a girl who goes to her city park and she starts seeing there that the bees um, are disappearing and she doesn't know why. And she wants to learn more about what's happening and see if she can save them. Um, so for me, I wanted to know that I was depicting the bees still pretty accurately, like scientifically speaking. I wanted them to not be too cartoony. I wanted them to be somewhat realistic, um, but I still wanted to have kind of my own artistic take on it. So I want to show you guys some of the things that I explored and learned in that process. So I'm going to go back to the picture of the bees and the wasps. I hope everybody's okay with that. Here we go. All right. So what I want you to look at here, okay? So we've got bees on one side and wasps on the other side. And I found that a lot of people don't treat them differently. A lot of time they call everything that is black and yellow and flies with wings and make, make a zippy sound, 
they all call them bees. They say a bee stung me, a bee flew in the house, a bee did this, a bee did that. And they're not always bees. A lot of times they're wasps. Now, what are some observations you can make? Things that you see that might show you the difference between bees and wasps. You can put it in the chat. If there's anything that you're noticing that's different between bees and wasps. Because here's some pretty significant differences here. Now feel free to put in the chat what you see there. Oh, Cindy says bees look furry. Yes, they do. Notice they have really fuzzy bodies, okay? Um, somebody says their wings are different. Yeah, you can notice that these, so their wings uh, on the wasps are a little bit narrower and longer. Wasps are long and bees are short. Yes, wasps tend to have longer bodies and bees tend to have kind of shorter, kind of fatter looking bodies. Okay, anything else that you noticed about the differences between them? We talked about the fur, what about the patterns on them? Do you see any differences in the patterns? Yeah, okay, good. Yeah, you might have noticed that we have some kind of basic bold stripes on the bees, just a pretty clearly alternating pattern of yellow and black. On the top is a bumblebee, and on the bottom is a honeybee, a European honeybee. Whereas on the wasp, we're seeing kind of more diamonds and dots and things like that in the, in the patterns. I also see here that wasps have long antennas, and that is true. You're seeing some examples of wasps that have long antennas. All right, so we've made some observations that help us understand the difference between a bee and a wasp. And if I was going to draw this, I would have a better idea of how to more accurately represent a bee. I would want the body to look really fuzzy and kind of be shorter and fatter and wider. Um, I would want to make sure that I didn't have any patterns in the black and yellow. I wanted it to be just kind of bold black and, and yellow stripes with maybe shorter wings and shorter antenna like you guys have pointed out. But Oh yes, wasps have a thin waist. That's true, that segment between their thorax and their abdomen is very, very small. It's like that on the bees also, you just can't tell that it is because of all the fur on their bodies. All right, so now let's narrow down on the bees and let's make some observations just about the bees. Now I showed you just two different kinds of bees, but actually where we live here in the Pacific Northwest, we have many different types of bees and these are not wasps or yellow jackets or hornets, these are considered bees. Now do I look up at our observations from before? Hmm, we have to kind of change some of our observations. What are some other things that we're noticing about the bees of the Pacific Northwest? Are they always yellow and black? No, right? We're seeing so, that bees can actually be other colors. They could be green. They could be white and black. They could be all black. They could be gray like this digger bee. They could be kind of this beautiful metallic blue like this small carpenter bee or red like the red nomad bee. So we have a lot of different colors they can be. We see their bodies can have a lot of different shapes. Some of them look more like ants. Okay, like this leaf cutting bee over here. Some of them look a little bit more like moths, like the cuckoo leaf cutter bee. Okay, so they can have very different shapes. So these are some things that I might take into consideration, but they're all observations that we can make. All right. Did any of you know that we had bees that looked like this? Some of them look more like flies. The next time that you're looking at a flower that's being pollinated by some kind of an insect, Stop and look carefully. I mean, you don't, you know, don't disturb them. They let them do their thing. But, you know, a lot of times we see bumblebees and we see the average, you know, the European honeybee that we're all very familiar with. That's not actually native to this area. That's the one that's not native other than um, the rest of them. Um, but look carefully and you might see something on there and you're thinking, is that a fly? What is it doing on that flower? And it's actually a bee. Now, one of the things I said is, okay, what do I notice? But now let's talk about getting small. So bring yourself now to the level of a bee and think, if I was really tiny like a bee, how would things look to me, okay? Maybe, you know, petals 
flower petals that are hanging down would look more like curtains to you, right? Maybe the stems of flowers would look more like tree trunks to you. And you might notice some other kinds of structures if you get to the level of a bee. You might notice that, oh, they have these like long tongues called proboscises that stick out. Bumblebees actually have longer tongues than any other kind of bee does, which is why they can pollinate some kinds of flowers that other bees cannot, which is really cool. Okay, if you get down on the level of a bee, you might notice things like, oh, they have these pollen baskets on their legs, right? They've got these big lumps of yellow. Have you ever seen those? Have you ever seen a bumblebee flying around with big pollen baskets on its legs? It seems like it shouldn't be able to even fly with those heavy things on its legs, but it actually can. What it does is it mixes its saliva with the pollen, I know this sounds kind of gross, and the nectar, and then it packs it onto its legs. It's so tightly packed onto that, to the legs. I've read that actually tornado force winds will not tear it away. They actually have to kind of chew it off once they get back to the nest. And then it's used to help feed the larvae, which are kind of the baby bees that are developing. But these are things that, you know, the size of these things, that they're grainy and kind of sticky like this, is something you might not notice if you weren't on the level of a bee, okay? And we talked about getting super duper small, like getting to the level of a bee, being tiny like a bee is. But what if you got even bigger and looked out over a wider space, like you were a giant and tried to learn something? Well, you might make some observations about, for instance, where bees like to live. Um, what kinds of flowers bees like best, the places that bees are avoiding. Um, this is from an article where they found in, um, in England, they found out that community gardens, kind of these gardens where people can um, borrow a plot of land and plant vegetables and things like that, that bees liked those areas more than they liked you know, house gardens, more than they liked being in parks, and more than they liked even being in the countryside. And if you kind of zoom out and take a big look at it like this, you can see there's probably a lot of variety of flowers there from all the different kinds of vegetables and fruits people are growing right? So that's pretty amazing right there. That's something that you only kind of understand when you take a big look away. It's an observation that you can make. Okay. And how would I describe what I see or hear? That was one of the other questions. So I wanted to show you guys how um, a bumblebee pollinates a flower. I looked at a lot of videos and pictures of bumblebees pollinating flowers to kind of get an idea of what their bodies were shaped up. But I'm gonna just play this for you. says ew. <laughs> Sorry, hold on, I gotta stop that one. Somebody said ew. <laughs> I think it looks cool. I think it's awesome. Their bodies are completely doused in pollen, right? So that's pretty neat. Um, how do they get doused in pollen? Why did I bring that up for what would you hear? Well, the way that they do it is that they actually vibrate their bodies. They vibrate them so hard that it shakes all of the pollen loose from the flowers and it completely coats their bodies with the pollen and then they go to another flower and that's how they transfer it. Now, not only that, but if you were to listen to the, the buzzing of a bumblebee, I think we all know what a, a bumblebee buzz sounds like, right? Or, or a bee buzz, right? There's actually something a little bit more special about the buzz of a bumblebee. It happens to um, be that, and I don't know, many, maybe some of you play an instrument like the piano, and maybe some of you are familiar with the note that's called middle C on a piano. Maybe you know that, yeah? So if you know middle C, that tone, yeah, so some of you are saying, yes, I play the piano. Well, um, if you know the tone middle C, that is actually the note at which 
a bumblebee buzzes. So I'm going to do that with my, I have a tuning fork here that is the tone middle C. So I'm going to ring this tuning fork and hopefully if we're, if I'm quiet enough, you guys are all quiet because I can't hear you. You'll be able to hear that middle C tone and know what I'm talking about. So let me see if I can get this thing to, to ring pretty loud. All right, here we go. Did you hear it? Buzz. That is the tone that is a buzz for the bee. I'll try to do it one more time. I don't know if I'm gonna get it loud enough, but try to make your area quiet where you are too so you can hear it. Here we go, one more time, I'll try it. Buzz. So that is actually the note of a bumblebee's buzz. Isn't that cool? There's something special about that particular frequency. Um, the, the tone C or the note C that actually makes the pollen explode even more. It's just the right frequency of vibration that the, the anthers, the parts of the flower that have the pollen on them start just shaking violently and then douse the bee with pollen. All right, let's move along here. Okay, what else can we say to help us make some observations? Oops, we already did that. Oh no, stop. Got that one. Okay, let's go on to the next one. Oh, tools, right? Cindy, were you the one that said tools? I think that you were, that you could use tools to help you make observations. And an example of a tool that might help you is, for example, like a, like a microscope, right? I use microscopes a lot as a science teacher. I was just using microscopes today. I thought, oh, wait a second. I think I have a pre-mounted bee leg. And so I put it on the microscope and I got this picture of it just today. I did not mount this bee leg myself. I already had it mounted from before. Um, it's stained red so that you can see it better. It's not from a red bee, if you were wondering. But this is its leg and you can kind of see some things here that you might not have realized were part of a bee's leg structure if you didn't have a tool that helped you make this kind of an observation, right? So this is actually its foot down here. And notice it's what's not like our foot. It's not like uh, sticking out with, you know, toes in one direction. It actually kind of has sort of these curves, um, sort of like a foot or toe in, in both directions. And you can see too that it's got separate segments leading down to that sort of its ankle from this position. You can see a lot of fur on it, even down to the legs. We kind of thought just the bodies were really fuzzy, but it looks like even the legs have a bit of fur on them too. Okay, so that's another thing that you can learn uh, from your observations and tools are really helpful for that. Now, a lot of illustrations um, that are scientific illustrations look very realistic. Okay, so you can see these are some examples of scientists who made illustrations that are very realistic looking. Up here on the top left, these are flowers from Carl Linnaeus. And so he was a scientist a long time ago that did a lot to study botany. We have Charles Darwin who came up with the theory of evolution. He looked at the beaks of finches and he made all sorts of meticulous drawings to help him better understand his observations about the beaks and how, you know, finches with a larger beak actually had advantages over other finches because they could eat larger seeds and nuts. So they were more likely to survive and pass that trait for large beaks onto their offspring. And then here's where science kind of starts meeting art. At the bottom here, Maria Sibylla Marion um, was a, a, an artist um, who did scientific illustrations, but they really um, bordered on being more than just scientific illustrations. You can see this is something like I would very much hang something this beautiful on my wall. There's just kind of the expression of color, the way that the, the butterflies and flowers are arranged. There's something really um, just uh, harmonious about this, the way that she's arranged it. And so this is kind of a place that I really aspire to in some of my art, maybe not to be this realistic, but to have touches of realism and have them arranged in a way um, or depicted in a way that feels artistic. Um, so on that note, 
I was thinking maybe I could do some picture book illustrations with you. I could show you guys how I would draw a bee or how I did draw a bee for bees bees. And then if you guys wanna do some drawing together, you might have time for a little drawing together as well, if that sounds okay. <laughs> I'm hoping it does. I can't hear your responses, but I'm gonna guess that that's okay with you. So what I'm gonna do right now is I told you guys that I'm doing a lot of my um, illustrations um, on my iPad and I can actually share my iPad screen with you and you guys can see me draw. And if you wanna draw along with me, you're welcome to get a piece of paper and a pencil or a pen and an eraser. So if you want to, why don't you go get those items right now and I'm gonna get my iPad hooked up to the screen. Okay, some people say that sounds like fun. Yes, I will do it. Yes, okay, good. I'm glad to hear that. All right, let me get this connected to my iPad. There we go, okay. And I put a picture of a bumblebee up in the corner there, um, just kind of be my inspiration for this, okay? And we'll draw this together and then we could maybe do some, um, some fun bees together as well. All right, so when I was making my illustrations for bees bees, some things that I tried to think about is, you know, a lot of people are scared of bees. So this is a fact, they're really important. They're very, very important for us to have the food that we have, right? Because they pollinate the food that makes the fruit and vegetables we like to eat. Um, but a lot of people are afraid of, you know, getting stung and when a bee flies in, they kind of freak out. So I wanted to make sure that they looked kind of realistic, but I wanted them to look pretty sweet too. Uh, so I knew that I wanted to still focus on the three parts of their body. You guys might know what those three parts of the body are. I kind of mentioned a couple parts of the body earlier, but we have over here, this is the head. And then this part that's kind of got their chest is called the thorax. And then this portion back here, this is called the ab, oopsie, abdomen. Okay. You guys know they have six legs and the hind legs are the largest. And you can see that um, this one doesn't really have any pollen on it right now, but there would be space back here for the pollen basket. And since this book is a lot about how bees help us through their pollination, I wanted to make sure that I included a pollen basket. Now you'll notice, so you know, everybody's like, draw the stinger, draw the stinger, Ellie. <laughs> they don't really have a very prominent stinger. And so you'll see my bees in my book, they don't really have a stinger that shows because you can't really see the stinger here. Okay, that's, you know, maybe there's kind of like a just a, oh, sorry. Uh, there's just like a dark spot right here, but that's, that's, I don't even know if that's a stinger, just kind of part of the shadows in the background. All right, so now I'm gonna start with just some very loose shapes that represent the head, the thorax and the abdomen, okay? So there we go, it's head. And there's the thorax. Is another lump. And here is the abdomen. The abdomen's kind of curved actually. So I wanna make sure that I have kind of curved. So here's just three circles that I'm starting with. And notice I'm kind of loose and sketchy. I don't really care if it's too messy. I'll just make darker lines over the lighter lines later. Okay. All right. Okay. Now, um, part of it looking really cute are the eyes, right? You cannot have, you know, beady, you know, scary bee eyes and have everybody think, oh, that's so cute. No, they've got to, they've got to look sweet. So what I did is I wanted to make it have a sweeter eye. So I put a little kind of a cheek right here and then a big curve here. And I did those kinds of eyes that you see a lot in kind of um, chibi characters where it has like the um, kind of like, here's the dark part up here and a couple little circles for uh, spots of light on the eyes. And then I just filled in the rest of it. And some people like to put like much bigger, the chibi characters usually have much bigger spots of light on their eyes, but I didn't want to get too crazy with it. But notice, I mean, I kind of kept that almond shape of the eye also. It's a little bit curved in the same way and it's fairly closely positioned, okay? 
The antenna, I thought were just, I mean, the antenna are, are darn cute. You can't say no to that. So I decided, oh, we can make those antenna about the same, right? What do they look like? They look like, like L's on their side. So we just put some antenna on there, okay? Um, the mouths, <laughs> they have mandibles. They have like little jaws and um, they're not the cutest. So I just gave mine smiles like that. I thought a smile would be fine. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna start filling in some fur now. So I might actually get myself a darker or a thicker tool here. And I wanted my bee to look furry. So I kind of started with thinking about the direction the fur goes kind of up and towards the back of the body. Okay. And here, it kind of seems a little bit longer and shaggier on the back. You know, maybe I could actually even make that kind of like a little bit silly in the front. Maybe he has kind of like a little hair sticking up in funny directions in the front. Would that really happen on a bee? Oh, probably not, but it kind of looks cute like that. Okay. So now I'm going to kind of make it a little bit extra furry and maybe add some shagginess down here too. All right. Kind of get the underside of the body. All right. I'm gonna think about where the stripes go. Oh, there's one there kind of high up on the thorax. And another stripe down here. Oh, and it's got a fluffy white tail as well. Okay. And then I'm gonna think about the wings. Now, I don't like to get too fancy with the wings because they, they're hard. So I just kind of do a loop and a loop. Okay, they're about similar, pretty close. And for the legs, I'm going to have the two shorter legs up in the front. Leg, leg, and then another bigger leg that goes towards the back, like this one. Yeah. Now, this looks kind of rough right now, I know, but once I have things a way that I like them, then I'm gonna to try to just trace over the top of it. So I'm gonna make this a little bit lighter and go over the top of it with just some darker colors or a darker um, pen that I like, okay? So I'm gonna kind of switch to maybe a marker here. And now I'm going to just keep the lines that I like and I won't retrace the lines that I don't like, okay? So these are lines I like. And you can do the same thing, you know, on a sunny day, you can hold it up with a piece of paper over it up to a window. That's a good way to trace things. I think that smile needs to be even broader. And so I'm just going to do the hair without the shape of the body underneath. Okay, get some legs in here. Get some antenna. I think maybe I want the antenna to be a little bit bolder than I did them before. You can change your mind as you're doing it. That's okay and a loop, and a loop now. So I'm just gonna show the one in the back like that. I'll just kind of leave some hash marks here to show where the stripe would be that I'm gonna be putting in with some color. Gonna make some little marks here to show where that would go. And finish up my feet. I almost said shoes, bees don't have shoes. <laughs> Might even do it like the bee leg that I saw where it had the feet that kind of go in both directions like that, just to be a little bit more accurate about it. Okay. And now we have a nice little bee sketch. And if I want to go fill that in, I can fill that in with some color. Let's see, where was my yellow? Yellow here and some yellow here. And maybe the rest of it, I'll do a gray so that it actually doesn't, um, blend in too much with the black that I put in. And there we go. We have a little bee that we made. Ta-da! I told you I'd show you some cute bees that you can make because maybe you don't always want to make a bee that looks like this, right? All right, so let's do that too. Let me just move this grouping off here to the side, make that a little bit tinier. And let's make some, just some cute bees because I always love making cute bees. Here's my favorite way to make a bee. 
Oopsie, that's too big. All right, I'm just gonna make an oval. All right, now I don't know why, but for some reason, whenever you put eyes close together and low on something, it just automatically looks cute. I, I smile. Look, it's automatically cute. It's a circle and two dots and a, and a C shape. And we made something cute. I don't know how it happens, but it just does. All right, now we're gonna make it a B, right? So it's gonna need some, some doodly boppers. Some people call those antenna. But if you're making a B like this, we call them doodly boppers. And then again, the wings I'm not gonna get fancy with because this is a little cute bee. But I like to give it little bee, the little wings that look like it could never, ever, ever hold that bee up. And we need to give it some stripes. And so we don't wanna do just straight lines down because if we did straight lines down, then it would look like the body was really flat. So we're gonna actually use some curves, C shapes like this. And Ah, uh, shoot, why not? We'll put a little stinger on there because I know you're all thinking about it. And then all we had to do is one, two, three. I'm just gonna show the three legs that would be closest to me. And ta-da, we got a bee. And you could do all kinds of bees like this. They don't have to be happy bees. They could be devious bees, right? It could look like they're coming out of nowhere. Maybe I'll make the legs go like this so that they look like they're speeding by and the doodly boppers will go like that. All right, all kinds of different ways. I'll do one more for you and then we'll wrap it up here. How about I do, oh, um, a very content queen bee. She's gonna be like this. All right, we'll give her a little crown and um, maybe she'll be carrying like a little, what do you call those things, a scepter? Yeah, scepter. I'll give her some eyebrows. She looks kind of weird without eyebrows. And her royal stripes. She gets to have a big stinger. And then there, maybe we'll give her like some sparkles around her wings because she's just so special. <laughs> so you can have fun with that one. There we go. Thanks, you guys. I really enjoyed that. I can't see you, but I'm hoping you enjoyed it as well. <laughs> you like her stars too. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ellie. That My was pleasure. wonderful. <laughs> Oh, that was such fun. I haven't gotten to see live drawing before like yeah, that. Yeah, to do. Yeah, I yeah. wish I could see your guys' pictures. Maybe at some point I'll be able to draw with you in person. That would be really fun. Oh, that would be great. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see. So um, we have a thank you slide that Natalie is going to put up in just a moment um, or, or two. <laughs> um, and you all can be thinking about your questions. If you have questions for Ellie, um, you could ask her a question. Um, so we just appreciate our friends of the library and our librarians and teachers of the Edmonds School District. We wanna make special note of those. Thank you, Natalie, that's fabulous. Um, does anyone have a question that they can think of that they would like to ask? I know if, if uh, Others don't have one. I did want to ask one question myself. Um, you mentioned um, that you had a new book coming out. Could you repeat the name of your new book? Yeah, it's called How to Hug a Pufferfish. Oh, wow. How that should be fascinating. Yeah. Can you tell us yeah, a little, little bit about it? Just a little bit? Yeah, sure. I'd be happy to. Um, so have you ever had the experience of you know, kind of needing your personal space, but maybe your friends are always like wanting to hug you and lean on you and pick you up and carry you places and give you a piggyback ride. And you're like, I just kind of need my own space, please. Um, so this is a book about a little pufferfish who, who has that kind of a need and has some friends that are a little 
a little gregarious and maybe don't understand her need for personal space um, and teaches them how to respect it and other ways to show how much they care. Oh, that sounds fascinating. Sounds amazing. All right, Natalie invited people if they have a question to put one in. I'm going to put in, so um, I didn't know that you were going to talk about bees tonight. And so that's exciting. And um, as you mentioned, you um, worked on Bees Bees. And if anyone would want to buy a copy of that, there are copies sure. available from your website. And I'm going to yes. put that into the chat. Let me do that. I'll put that. Yeah, if you're interested in any of my books, you can go to my website and I'll put that in the chat right now. Oh, thank you. Um, and I think it's Dash Shop. Let me just double check that. And um, you'll see all three books are uh, available there. Yeah, and if you live in the Linwood area, um, we can make sure that they are delivered to the Linwood Library so that you can pick them up if you would like to. And as a bonus, you can get books and movies and things from the library too. That um, is correct. Yes, absolutely. Yes. So here, I'll put that on there. I think that is it. it. Oh, fantastic. Yes. Okay. Yes. Well, I know that people have um, uh, other other appointments today, but um, we're so glad. Oh, Cindy had, was Cindy, did she have a question? Or was that an accidental hand raise? <laughs> yes. Oh. All right, well, <laughs> we'll get it to work. Yeah, if you just actually type in, you don't actually need to put the HTTPS. If you just put that in, it will make it, it makes an automatic assumption that that's what you want. Yeah. Can you repeat all of your books, Ellie? Because someone asked what books you have. Sure. The um, three books that I have, here's the, just to the main website. Um, the three books that I have are, um, the first one that I did is Bees, Bees, and that one is the, the one that I'm an illustrator for. And then the other two, I'll grab them here. Ooh. Yeah, there we go. This is called It's Round, Round World, which is about how we know that the earth is round. And this one is called The Reason for the Seasons. And um, I think, did you guys, did you tell them about their their prize? Well, um, we, we think that maybe some of the their teachers did, but we want to make okay. sure um, that they know everyone who created a poster um, that was put on the Facebook page, those 30 students who created a poster, they will get a copy of the reason for the season. And Ellie has signed them all. And I have. <laughs> and I, I bet she has a little bit of writer's cramp. <laughs> um, and so we, go ahead. No, it was fine. Yeah, I'm really excited. So everyone, I have put your name into it and um, uh, I have also um, put a bookmark in there for you. That's wonderful. So yeah. um, we are going to make sure that we get those to the Linwood Library so that you can pick them up there. And I will let all of your um, uh, librarians or teachers know when they're ready. We're okay, and here, that. let me put in, so I think if I put, yeah, if you put at the end, somebody was saying that, can I log in? You don't need to log into my website. If you just put, the um the slash and shop at the end then you'll get to the bookshop but Great. make sure yeah. that you're checking in with your parents before you do any of that okay <laughs> before you, buy you can look around stuff. the website there's only fun stuff for kids to look at there but don't don't make any purchases yeah. without that's mom and dad's approval please thank yeah. you yes absolutely yes well we'll give maybe one more minute if anyone has a question but um here you go we got to it um it's just been so much fun we've really enjoyed it and um thank you so much for um paying such careful attention to the students art and making comments on it and that's really fun i i guess i had another question if it's not too much <laughs> if i'm not asking too many questions no but, i don't mind at all. Um, <laughs> so uh tell us uh what what grades or subjects you teach yeah, I teach a uh, sixth grade science and the subjects that we usually do are the whole span. So we're doing life sciences and um, astronomy, physical sciences and some earth sciences. Wow, well. that's so, impressive. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right now we're learning about cells. So we are doing a lot of work with microscopes and um, getting little samples of things to look at, which is 
why I had that bee leg out. I had somebody do a microscope slide of a spider leg today and a fly oh, wow. head today and a dragonfly wing too. So they were pretty cool. That's wonderful. So if um, I think we, I don't think that our, um, our raising the hand feature is, is enabled today. I think if you, if you have a question, you do have to put it in the chat. <laughs> um, if, you're, if you're just communicating with your other students, um, <laughs> you know that um, you can save that for maybe another time, I guess. Do, do you have any thoughts on that, Natalie? How, can you see anyone's questions? Um, I, <clears throat> so I lowered her hand. I think it was an accident. And I think if we don't respond, it just keeps telling us that she raised her hand over and over okay. again. I don't think it was okay. on purpose. Okay. And then okay. um, there were two Q and A's, but they were, I, they were fine. We don't need to answer them. I think they might've been accents that were meant for the chat. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, um, Thank you so much again, Ellie, for coming and talking with us. And thank you to all the families, um, the students who came tonight. Thank you for making posters. Um, we are so glad that you came tonight. Um, so please keep reading and keep creating. And thank you very much. Have a great evening tonight. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thanks for coming. Thanks.